Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. Following me on sharing my videos is really very important. I'm a one-man shop with no money for advertising, so social media is the way I, that I grow. So please follow me on Twitter, at SYL Tales, and any other social media. It's on the About page for the channel. I would appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch store on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. So, here we are, Doctor Who, Season 12, Episode 9, Ascension of the Cybermen. Uh, as a non-spoiler review, I guess I can say... Meh. I mean, um, it's not a horrible episode. It, um, it's just kind of a meh. Uh, you kind of need to watch this if you're going to do a setup for next week's episode, but... As an episode on the whole, it's just kind of meh, with the exception of a few moments. So, unlike most reviewers, I don't just sit down and I talk, walk through the plot, pausing to say what I liked or didn't. You will always find more depth with me, except Batman reviews, than any other reviewer, because I will touch on everything that goes into making a film or a TV show. So, we will just take it as read that if you've come to this video looking for a review, you've already watched Doctor Who Season 12, Episode 9, Ascension of the Cybermen, or you just don't care if you have it spoiled. But, for safety's sake, we should probably issue a... Yeah. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a Fandai master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me. And this is neither a boast nor a brag. This is sadly where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to two over a hundred years' worth of science fiction. The problem with Fandai masters is that we are cursed. You just can't see all of this new stuff without seeing the century that came before. And you find out there's not that much that's original, and it sometimes interferes with your ability to enjoy things. One thing I do not do is outrage videos. There are a lot of reviewers on YouTube and other places who are simply actors portraying outrage because outrage sells. They uh, seem to hate everything with a knee-jerk reflex because the viewers want to see them hate things. But this causes a weird feedback loop between fans and popular YouTubers because the YouTubers will be enraged, the fans will go away enraged, and the YouTubers will be enraged by something else, the fans will go away enraged by something else. It just feeds off of each other until finally nobody can you know, enjoy anything, even if it's any good. So I don't do that. If I like something, I will tell you why in detail. If I don't, like something, I will tell you why in detail, but I do not do outrage. Unlike other reviewers, I am the adult in the room. Okay, I usually try to start off a review talking about what I think are good things, the great moments in it. Um, one of the great things that I liked was the Doctor being extremely adamant that her companions flee the Cyberman. I thought that was very nice. I mean, so far... Whitaker's doctor has had really little connection to her past. This is clearly, finally, a um, reaction to Bill having been converted to a Cyberman, and it works very well here. I thought all the Cybermen waking up in the war uh, carrier was nice. It was very reminiscent of reveals of very similar uh, Cybermen reveals in Classic Who. I thought it was a good callback. I must admit, I'm a little mystified about what's going on with Brendan. Now, this is either a good thing or a bad thing, and we'll find out next week. I do continue to believe that this is tied up, and it's some sort of poor man's implementation of what Whovians call the Cartmel Master Plan. Now, this it was to have been a Seventh Doctor story arc had that series not been canceled. It was an explicit attempt by then scriptwriter Andrew, Andrew Cartmel to provide a more mysterious backstory for the Doctor that went back into ancient Time Lord history. Now, I'm not going to spoil this for you, but if you want to read about it um, and see the specifics, I do have a link to it in my description box below. I ultimately think all of this is going to be tied up in the giant space warp star Stargate thing leading to Gallifrey, where the humans went, wh who the Ruth Doctor is, who the timeless girl was, and why the Master destroyed Gallifrey. And hopefully the execution on this will be good. But with Chris Chibnall writing it, who the hell knows? The guy's a hack. Cringe moments. I had a lot of those. 
Now, I watched this episode twice, as I always do, from re reviews at least twice, for, even for modern shows. I do it first time so that I can watch and see if I like it, and the second time I can go back and sort of analyze why I didn't like it, or didn't. I, like I said, this was just meh. Uh, so I watched the episode twice, and I never caught the names of the non-regular characters except Ko Shemus, and that because it was made a story point. This is indicative that you've written really unmemorable characters. Graham has a line, we have to lug all this stuff down there when they're at the top of this hill, and hey, Graham would be good at cringe moments. The doctor had the exact coordinates where they were going to be, yet she landed the TARDIS a mile away. Even if, she, if she'd just landed closer, then everyone would have escaped, and, uh, you know, safe and sound. But she had to do it that way because plot. It was lazy writing, the usual Chris Chibnall crap. It's a small thing that I have, but Yaz bitching about Graham, complaining about the amount of things he has to carry down this big hill. Well, I don't know if you noticed, darling, but Graham is carrying twice the amount of equipment that both you and Ryan are carrying. So, you know, try pulling your own weight before you start bitching. And frankly, I assume that this is just another you know, uh, dig at men that they seem to have here. But unfortunately, it doesn't work since Graham is carrying twice as much as she is. Another small thing, you know, while I like that the sky of this planet on which they landed, it was kind of cool. It was clearly not a planet. There is an enormous ringed gas giant in the sky. This has got to be a moon, not a planet. Again, very small thing. <laughs> The TARDIS, having really advanced technology that can fight off Cybermen, but it's being run off of a 12-volt car battery. Okay, yeah, I know, the Doctor can be kind of steampunk sometimes, but I mean, seriously? The Cybermen have a weakness to gold. Well-known weakness to gold. The first time uh, the Doctor met them, I believe, he uh, stopped them by you know, just shoving gold in their faces, basically. So the doctor has a machine that throws gold particles into the air, but apparently it uh, didn't do that very well since the cyber heads had no difficulties at all. So Cybermen heads as drones. Uh, yeah. Moving on. The doctor keeps screaming for people to stop and not run, just hit the ground. The cyberheads are there to kill everyone, or at least keep them contained prior to being upgraded. Now, I tell you this, Doctor, you, you have to understand a stationary target is a lot harder to hit. It's a lot easier to hit than a moving target. So when people are moving, I, you know, run for the hills. <laughs> uh, one thing that's kind of weird was outright killing a child on screen. I thought it was rather dark. Why is this uh, formerly lone Cyberman such a technological mess still? I mean, you'd think that he would have done something by now to make it look like they're not like the rusted Tin Man and half of his face missing. And the Cyberman can't decide if they are deleting, that is, killing the humans or converting them. Which is it? They say two different things at different times. The Cyberheads, by the way, are pretty decent shots. The Cybermen, not so much. It turns out that an army of Cyberheads would be far more effective than just the Cybermen themselves. And why do Cybermen still need big blaster rifles when they have a nice blaster right on their right arms? I mean, the arms, literally in terms of, I'm a firearms enthusiast, and I've always thought, you know, that would be something like that would be much easier to aim than a gun. You know, you're aiming off with your arm. It, it, one of the things that works well with guns is if you can have a, what's called a grip angle that looks something like this because it's easier to line up a set, uh, something in the sights if your grip angle is at an angle something like this. Cyberman can do this. That is perfect. It is just like pointing at something. It's much, much easier. Same as this grip angle is easy to point something at and, you know, see down the slides and have your hand be, you know, mostly in normal position. Having a gun on your arm is, again, a perfect thing. You can use that to aim. And I don't know why they even bother with blasters ever. Graham. He would never have left Ryan behind. That is totally out of character. He have, would have run out of that closed door, sh that ship's door. Before it even closed, he would have left Yaz there, even if it meant certain death. But 
he had to be completely out of character because of plot. So the doctor isn't so much of a pacifist now. Um, this seems a little bit out of character for someone who has eschewed violence ever since they have been fought in the time war and killed many, many, many people. You know, the, the, the last doctor in his beautiful speech uh, where he talks about all the people he's killed and when he closes his eyes, he hears more screams than you can possibly imagine. How has that changed from that doctor to this one? She killed all those people just in another incarnation. This shouldn't be something that bothers her. So she's got this grenade, and I understand that it's uh, going to be used to try to incapacitate the Cybermen, but it just seems to me that a better writer would have been able to think up something where the doctor did something clever rather than just blowing something up. And besides, to be honest, the grenade was not that effective. All it does is knock the formerly known Cyberman off of his feet for a while. Now, if they have a mile to run or so to the cyber shuttle, I mean, that's what it looks like from the distance they're running, a mile or so, why not just run the mile that they went to the TARDIS and left it out there? Or worse, fly the cyber shuttle to the TARDIS. But they couldn't do that because of plot. Um, there's a line here. The doctor has, if it helps, have a ginger. And she holds up a little packet of things. Oh, come on, Chris. Everyone was expecting a jelly baby. Why did you need to change it? I mean, I guess it's the same reason that you got rid of unit, because you want to have a pointless, you know, a pointless need to change things that have always worked so that you can show how much better you are. Well, Chris, look at the ratings and tell me how that's working out for you. This show could be canceled at the end of this season, thanks to Chris Chibnall. The formerly lone Cyberman says that the uh, war carrier is the site of their greatest defeat, yet it's filled with Cybermen. If they were in a battle, wouldn't it have been nice to have those Cybermen awake? Maybe it wouldn't have been a defeat if they had. And also this formerly lone Cyberman, because of this uh, Cybercron thing that Jiggy's got, seems to know about this um, place and you know, you know, it can't be that far from where the humans were because their ship broke down and they're just floating around until they find the spaceship. Wouldn't it have been a good idea to stop off at this carrier, fire it up, wake up the Cybermen, and get the formerly lone Cyberman and his buddies repaired, and then go kill all humans? But they don't because of plot. There's a great exchange between J Graham and Yaz that occurs fairly early on when they get on the uh, carrier. Graham says, war carrier, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Yaz says, what was it carrying? Well, Graham and Yaz would be good at cringe moments. Graham doing Cockney rhyming. Is this, I have to ask, because I, I don't know if I've got British viewers, let me know. Is this still a thing in the UK? Because as a former actor, I thought that it was really something very stereotypical that bad acting schools taught American actors rather than teaching them actual modern dialects and the way that Brits really speak. Now, if the former lone Cyberman and all his buddies have to wake up Cybermen on the war carrier by, I don't know, basically sticking some kind of uh, cattle prod into them and making them scream, if they have to do that with all of them, this is going to take a hell of a long time to wake them up. So if it were me, I'd use this time to take the ship to Co-Shamus, set a course for the local sun, put it on auto autopilot, and take off in one of the cyber shuttles. But then, oh wait, it turns out that they don't have to do weird things to every Cyberman after all, because plot. And those are my cringe moments. Now, the writer, I always talk about the writing first because without a script, you have nothing to shoot. And the good or the bad is always the fault of the writer. So the writer is Chris Jibnall. Well, I pretty much went through it. He wrote a script that had a lot of cringe moments, a lot of bad stuff, a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense. And uh, that all speaks for itself. It's just not that good. It's the usual Chris Trib Chibnall tripe. In terms of the acting, Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor. Always want to mention to you fangirls, you have been squeeing over doctors since 2005, and I find it very fun and very smug that this Doctor is old enough, 
close enough to my age that I can have a squee moment over her too because she's a very beautiful woman. And I like it very much. I find her a lot more sexy when she has something intelligent to do. You know, not just throwing grenades, but placing her in a moral decision where she has to make some kind of moral decision or placing her in a place where she has to come up with something clever to do in order to get them out of the thing. The Really, the only moment that really struck me on that was when she is, again, extremely adamant that the companions flee the Cybermen. You know, that's very nice. It is clearly her characterization from her last regeneration when Bill was made into a Cyberman. There's no way back from that. She doesn't want that to happen again. Get out. Really nice. And again, when she does something good, when she's given good material, something fun to do, I think she's sexy as hell. Bradley Walsh, uh, Walsh rather, as Graham. As always, Graham is my favorite companion. It may be because of his age, because he's close to me. He seems to have his head on straight most of the time. He is an optimist, as is mentioned several times in this episode. I think... They should get rid of all the other companions and just go with Graham. The problem, as I've stated many times before since I've been reviewing this in the Chibnall era, the problem is you have 10 episodes and four people to do character development for. There just isn't time to do that kind of character development. You don't get character development. A lot of people say that this is bad because, oh, the doctor's a woman or something like that. No, 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 no. The doctor's gender has nothing to do with it. It has to do with Chibnall's character development and the stories that he's got. He has no arcs. He has no arcs. This one is basically a tie-in to the first one and one episode a few weeks ago for a little bit, but there's no arc what usually happens is the doctor has what's called one and done shows. That is, you can come in, do something, and the viewer will be left feeling satisfied at the end. But you will also find out things during that episode that then will contribute to the overall, overall arc for the season. You will find out little bits of information so that by the time you get to the end, it all comes together. All these plot threads that you've been building just come together. When you only do the stuff at the beginning, the stuff at the end, it isn't really an arc. Anyway, Bradley Walsh as Graham, um, you know, again, he's my favorite one. I think you should get rid of the others because you just don't have time for character development for that many characters. I think it needs to be the doctor and one companion, maybe two. You can get away with that if you have something like Amy and Rory who are, you know, joined at the hip and their characterization feeds off of each other. But most of the time, one companion, because then even in 10 episodes, you have a chance to do overall character development for them over 10 episodes. And the same with the Doctor, because their character developments tend to be intertwined. I would do Graham and the Doctor, because I think he has his head on the best straight. And, you know, he's a, he's a good front man when, in places where the Doctor might need him. I'm going to lump Tosin Cole and Mandip Gill. Ryan and Yaz, kind of together because they do fine performances. They do great with the material that they're given. They make the most of it. However, they really don't have that much. They have no character development, and they really are used as catalyst for other actions. They don't drive the action most of the time. They are catalyst for other actions. I mean, there's some stuff that they do, you know, like on Graham says, we can't give up, we got to do these things. But again, that's a catalyst for the action. He's not actually doing anything. He's telling somebody else what to do. It's catalyst for action. So the other two companions, all of them really, they, they, they don't have much here. They do well with what they're given. There's never a moment when I said that's weird, that's out of character, ex except for you know Graham. That's weird, that's out of character, or I don't believe that the actor, they're not selling it. They are not being genuine. You know, I thought I never thought that. It's just that they really don't have much to do aside from be catalysts for action. There is Ian Mc... Uh, sorry, I'm screwing this up. Ian McHellinery. Yes, Ian McHellinery as uh, Co Seamus. Uh, he wasn't in the episode for very long, but I, I actually liked what he was given was good, actually. You know, a guy who has been left behind here as the final sentinel to wait for other people. He hasn't seen any in a long time, and he knows where they're going, which is Gallifrey, but not the Gallifrey of the present, which is very interesting. Uh, Kevin Hudson as the cyber warrior, again, totally believed him. Um, yeah, my only issue was 
Um, there, uh, there would have been opportunities for him to get fixed, and he doesn't seem to take them or care. Um, but I do like him. He's, uh, he's you know, unplugged from what the Cybermen usually are. Makes him a nice, uh, you know, uh, really crazy kind of Cyberman who's bent on doing things that Cybermen don't usually do because of who they are. So this guy's an individual rather than being sort of this collective mind. So, um, you know, I liked that very much. I thought that was very good. I thought his uh, performance was good. In terms of the non-regular cast, I really have nothing to say about them. I mean, Chibnall killed off half of them by the 15-minute mark, and the rest were generic, forgettable. I, I don't, I never even caught most of their names. Now, their performances are fine. It's just that they were forgettable due to Chibnall's writing. <laughs> Sacha Dewan as the master, he only appears here for about like five seconds, maybe ten seconds, but... Man, is he memorable. I, I really like him as the master. What a great entrance, he says. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Director on this one was Jamie Magnus Stone. Now, while it was mostly CGI, the it's still something that the, the director has a hand in. They say, I want to do it this way. So the beginning where they're flowing through space and they come through that Cyberman's eye hel of the helmet and then they use that to do the opening titles. Awesome. Very, very good. I like that very much. However, the battle shaky cam was too much in many places. Most of the photography on this was done using handheld cameras, and it got real shaky cam at various points. Now, I understand that Stone was probably going for this whole sort of saving Private Ryan thing where they did that. But the thing is, I watched these episodes on my 42-inch screen with a banging sound system, and with all the shaky cam sitting in front of me, because I th that screen is literally in front of me. It's about three, three and a half feet from my eyes. So uh, I have a pretty, you know, the field of view is pretty full. And so the shaky cam was too much. It became difficult or impossible to follow the action. Too much shaky cam. Cinematographer here is Sam Heisman. We last saw him in his work on Fugitive of the Jadoon. The shaky cam again was way over the top. Now, no doubt that this was the director's choice, and Heisman simply had no choice but to try to get the shots. And I guess he got them. But one would hope that maybe a different or more you know, experienced cinematographer would alert the director that it was too much. I always like to say, regular viewers, you'll hear it again. You'll probably hear it a lot because until I have such a large following that I don't need to say these things over and over, I'm going to assume that I'm going to have a lot of you viewers. And so if you're a new viewer, this is the first time you've heard this. But... In a perfect world, the director and the cinematographer have some kind of good relationship where they collaborate. And their job is the, the director says, I want this shot. The cinematographer says, absolutely, I can get you that shot. But sometimes they will canoodle. They'll talk amongst themselves. And the cinematographer might say something like, um, the shaky cam here is way too much. We, we need to tone that down some. You know, I can get you the shot that you want, but maybe we should have the camera just a little more steady than the shaky cam. You know, so that that wasn't really going on here, I don't think, or the cinematographer thought that this was good. I don't know. Um, but in any case, the shaky cam was too much. The production designer here, none is listed neither in the credits nor on IMDb, but you have to have a production designer. You have to on any kind of TV show or film. You just can't without making it. I did like the production design just fine. Um, the, uh, the, I thought that the, you know, um, sort of encampment they were living in made sense. You know, um, the interior of the broken down human ship, that was good. That was good. Uh, the cyber shuttle, um, Okay, it was fine. It was okay. Uh, the uh, interior of the uh, war carrier. Now, that was very good. I liked that very much. I mean, they had to make use of somewhat smaller sets for various people. But when they got into where they had all the Cybermen and there was a lot of CGI involved in those, I thought that was real good. They had designed that real well. Music as always is by Sagun Akanola. IMDb also lists a score mixer, which probably means that this episode had music that Akanola had previously written, and then it was mixed together for the episode. Now, that's not uncommon. There isn't just an unlimited budget for music, so they generally save new material for what they think are going to be the most important episodes, and then reuse those cues by editing them together to work for other scenes and episodes. And uh, it works fine here. 
I don't know, honestly, if we're hearing new music. I'll talk about that in a second. If it were me, honestly, I, my new music would have been in like episodes one and two and then episodes nine and ten. Maybe that's going on here. I don't know. The problem is that the music remains, you know, just forgettable. I don't dislike it, but it doesn't stick in my head the way that Murray Gold's music did for 10 years. Now, I'll tell you something weird about me. I watched it last episode. I'll probably mention it other times when I'm talking about music. Because a lot of people have, they process information by having an inner dialogue. You know, that basically is words streaming through your head at all times. And we choose what to say based on an edited version of that inner dialogue. My own inner dialogue, besides having, you know, aside from the fact that I've been an, you know, an American who's born and raised here and uh, for 50 years, I still have my inner dialogue that speaks English, but also French on occasion because I became fluent in that language at a very early age. But I also have an inner dialogue that consists of music. It's almost exclusively orchestral film music, which is heavily influenced by my collection of more than 400 soundtracks. Lots of people tend to get music that's stuck in their heads and they can't get it away for a while. But my music constantly plays, and I can change it and alter it if I want. Essentially, my head's kind of an inner iPod. But the issue with Akinola's music is that it, my inner soundtrack finds it forgettable, you know, where Murray Gold's music is part of the collection. And I've not even listened to Murray Gold's music on soundtrack collections, um, just on episodes. So that means it is so memorable that my inner music grabbed it while listening to the episodes. And this is a very, very good sign that the music is very, very good. But having an unmemorable score like Akinola's, that, that music does not enter my head, just fits the action, and, uh, you know, it's just not particularly brilliant, I don't think, because it does not stick in my head at all. Sound I'm going to mention here. I don't usually mention sound mixing um, and sound effects because unless it's bad, you don't really notice. But in this case, there were a number of occasions where it was bad. Now, I watched this. As I said, I'm a big 42-inch with the banging sound system. And there were occasionally a number of occasions where the sound of the battle would obscure important dialogue. Now, I noticed it first when everybody piled into the then broken down human ship. And uh, the... Um, uh, the sound of the Cybermen and the cyber heads blasters on the hull of the ship obscured the dialogue. And some of this was important because it was exposition about why they were taking a risk, even flying the ship, you know, to begin with. And uh, not to mention announcements about the characters that had just died and were some level of character development for the months remaining. It was also noticeable uh, when the human ship was in the process of failing uh, with all the alerts and other sounds that were going on, the dialogue was obscured. The processing also of the formerly lone Cyberman was a bit over the top, and sometimes it made his dialogue impossible to understand. Special effects supervisor is Sheila Wickens. She is the effects supervisor for the entire season. But as always, the real work is done by a small army, and it is really impossible to attribute any one effect to any person. With modern CGI, of course, you really only notice when the effects are bad. And while there were nothing bad here, uh, it was certainly all realistic and appropriate. And again, I liked that sky, whatever the planet they land on is. That was very, very nice. I liked the reveal of all the Cybermen just waking up. It was nicely done. Again, you know, obviously CGI to get those big, long corridors. But it's very similar to reveals that we've seen in Classic Who. So nice callback. There were probably more green screens here than you'd imagine. Certainly every shot where they were, you know, doing something were looking down a long corridor. Well, they didn't build that. That was, you know, green screen. And sometimes they put them in places you just have no idea where are. And the fact that you have no idea means it was well executed. Costume designer is Ray Holman. He is costume designer for all of season 12. And my regular viewers will have heard this, but I want to hear it today again, because what if new viewers come in? I don't have a ton of, uh, of subscribers at the moment, so anybody that news that comes in, I want to hear it. Costumes should always tell you something about the character. So, for example, people make choices in their own life about what you know, clothes to wear, and one person makes a different choice than another person, and, you know... So, like if you saw me on the street today, you would have seen me with a, uh, the Moods of Chuck Norris t-shirt, where it's just the same thing over and over for every mood. 
uh, emotion and my uh, you know jeans, jeans and a t-shirt, and that will tell you something about who I am. When I'm wearing what I am now, no one, absolutely no one, wears this sort of thing anywhere that I've ever seen. This is a costume. You know, unlike a lot of people, I will tell you all about the theatricality that I am doing. Like my green screens, I choose them very carefully for what I'm reviewing. So this is a costume. I'm trying to project a certain image, and hopefully I'm doing it well. I'm not going to tell you what the image is particularly, but hopefully you, you know, get a feeling about me that maybe you wouldn't if I was wearing something else. But I will always tell you about my own when I'm doing any kind of uh, theatricality. I have no problem with that. So in terms of costuming here, um, what was the human costumes made perfect sense. You know, they were people who had been on the run for a long time. They didn't exactly have, you know, fresh, clean clothes all the time. So that was very good. The doctor and her companions wear stuff that is usually the sort of thing they wear. Of course, the doctor wears the same thing all the time. But the other companions were doing fine as well. Um, one of the things that I really liked was the heads of the Cybermen on the war carry. They were very, very reminiscent of the Fifth Doctor era Cyberman heads, as well as Handles, if you remember him, from the time of the Doctor, and it was a very nice callback. Makeup designer for the series is Clara Pritchard. I always like to point out she's interesting because she did makeup for all of season 12, all of season 11, and uh, most of season 11, rather, and then on and off on Doctor Who, all the way back to when she was a makeup artist on Dalek, a first season Doctor Who episode. So she's been around a long time. Uh, in terms of the makeup, you know, really the only alien type makeup we see is with the formerly lone Cyberman and half of his face being shown. And we saw that done well last week and it's done well here. We can see the emotions that he's feeling and it, it works. Uh, the other makeup is largely practical. And I always want to point out that it's tough to do practical makeup even in 1080p because actors have blemishes in their skins and you don't necessarily want them to show so they will cover them with makeup that's normal it's what you've always done but sometimes if they're covering something up it looks the makeup looks caked on in 1080p i never noticed that everybody looked perfect uh, either they were hiring actors with absolutely no skin in professions which never happens or they were covering it up very very well so good on them so I want to make a few predictions about how this is all going to turn out. I'm going to be all fandom mastery on you, and I'm going to make a few predictions based on what I think is going on here. I think the humans who went through the Stargate thingy were actually the first Gallifreyans. And I think Brendan is somehow related to Captain Jack. I'm not sure. The Ruth Doctor, she's going to be one of the first Time Lords. And she is descended from the humans who went through this Stargate, the very, very first Gallifreyans. Now, the Doctor doesn't remember her because, the, she doesn't remember the Ruth Doctor because the Doctor herself has, in fact, had not one, but numerous 12 regeneration cycles dating back a long time, you know, potentially a billion years to when the Time Lord Society started. So, what the Time Lords have been doing is wiping her memory from time to time. So she just doesn't remember things that went on in her past. But she's going to have a pivotal, uh, important role in this first founding of Gallifrey that, again, is part of this um, poor man's cardinal master plan. So we will see. We will see. So at the end of any episode, we might ask ourselves, is it any good? <sighs> Meh. There were a lot of cringe moments, a lot of things that didn't make sense because they had to have plot and people were out of character and stuff that didn't make sense and all was just in service of plot. Um, you know, if I was going to recommend this, just, just somebody, anybody who didn't know much about Doctor Who, I'd say, you know, this is, this is not a good representative how good Doctor Who can be. Uh, it is a setup for the next episode. So we will have to, if you're going to watch it, it's for the setup. So we'll have to see how that goes. Hopefully, Chidnall will somehow, you know, meet or even exceed my expectations, which with the Chibnall era are damn near next to dinosaur bones. And that is all that I have to say about that. I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to them. So, a little bit of ad copy. In the style of the immortal Ernie Anderson, who was one of those voiceover guys that you used to hear. 
Next time on the Fandai Master's Review of Doctor Who. The true identity of Ruth is revealed when the Doctor and friends travel to Mundas to defeat the lone Cyberman. That's next time on the Fandai Master's Review of Doctor Who. So, thanks for watching. I would love to, you know, that's all the time that we have today for this episode of Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.